So hey there, my name is Kristen Ruiz and I'm here with my brilliant co-host Geneva Main. And our special guest today is no stranger to voice care circles. So we're thrilled to welcome Walt Fritz here to our podcast. So if you don't know, he's worked as um, a manual therapy educator since the 1990s. And uh, his work has evolved into teaching a unique interpretation of manual therapy for voice care professionals. Uh, he presents his workshops internationally, so you may catch some of his workshops um, through his foundations in manual therapy seminars, and he maintains a physical therapy practice in upstate New York. And you can find a link to his website, waltfritz.com, in our show notes. So in today's episode, we are going to be exploring manual therapy and shared decision making as agentic practices. Awesome. Before we begin, let's check in to see what's new and what's good. So I'll start by saying that I did some of the most everyday things this weekend and it felt so good. <laughs> so I took my bike, I think, to the bike shop to get um, a tune up and I haven't ridden my bike in quite a while. So it feels good to finally be getting that going because it means bike rides this fall. And I went out apple picking at Herd's Farm in upstate New York. And that was so fun. I had such a good time seeing the families out and um, having apple donuts and apple cider and being in the sunlight and the fresh air and felt really good. So you know, it's um, a really small world. My family actually knows the Herd family. Oh, really? You're kidding me. <laughs> so it's Herd's Family Farm, H-U-R-D, and it's just a nice little orchard. And that felt really good to be doing something right. not too academic, which I've been doing for the last couple of years. So yeah. <laughs> How about you, Walt? Anything new and good for you? You know, um, the good stuff is right now the sun's out compared to what it's been. But, um, I, you know, I've just been trying to wind down a little bit from a lot of um, projects that got my anxiety boosted and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it's, al it's always something, but just trying to find that, that little slice of, of quiet in the middle yes. of all that. And, um, and yeah, so just, I've got a book coming out if I finally wait for my images to come back from the artist. Art, artist. So that's what I've been working on and stressing over. So it's nice just to kind of go out for my evening walk with my wife every night and uh, and just decompress a little bit from all of that, plus all the stuff that I do here and traveling and all the good stuff that I love about my life. But so that's there it is. Awesome. Yeah. So excited. Can't wait for that book. Yeah, Thanks. me too. <laughs> it's a lot of work, I know. It is, yep, yep. Yeah, on mine, it's actually been returning back to some research. It got put on uh, the back burner for a while. So some new and good things that have been coming up for me is I'm back into working on my research, looking at voice pedagogy through the lens of adult and uh, adult development theory. So it's kind of looking at how does the voice work and then how does one learn to work a voice and the meaning that we make from our training or performance experiences in a way that cultivates skill. So, and I'm using the work of Dr. Barbara Dosher to explore the connection between these two fields and I'm writing up the, the findings now and I'm just finding it very fulfilling, stretching. I can't wait until I can, it's ready to share. And um, I'm kind of just celebrating the giants who came before us and celebrating the, the gold nuggets that they're giving us because I find that as I'm reading through some of this stuff, I feel stretched and, and I feel that, that growing juice that feels so good. So that's what's new in, and good going on for me these days. All right, so let's move on to our agentic practice. We are so lucky to have Walt Fritz PT here because we are going to learn some more about the nuances of manual therapies. And what's really cool is that during my doctoral studies, I came across um, several articles, but two really stood out discussing manual therapy and voice care, and they made me pause. So the first, was an article published in 2019 by Nelson Roy and colleagues, and it was stating that a 61-year-old woman with a moderate to severe primary muscle tension dysphonia was able to improve her vocal agency and shift a dysfunctional neural pattern towards neural activation patterns associated with normal voicing after just one successful um, treatment session using manual circumlaryngeal techniques. And that was pretty cool that it was that effective and that fast. Um, and then though, I read a second article published in 2021 
and it was on consensus recommendations for managing functional neurological disorders, such as primary muscle tension dysphonia. And that one was written by Janet Baker and colleagues, and I believe uh, Nelson Roy was among those colleagues. And it was stating that just prior to touching the neck, the throat, and the larynx, it's important to explain what the clinician is going to do and why, and to ask permission to palpate, massage, or reposition the larynx. So the reason why these um, articles made me pause is that one seemed to be just saying that manual therapy was really, really good and really, really effective. And the other seemed to be cautioning how it was used. So I thought, hmm, this is um, interesting. So I don't know what you think about manual therapy uh, or what you know about manual therapy, Kristen, but since we have an expert here, let's ask. <laughs> Sort of. what, exa what exactly is manual therapy and how is it used to aid in voice rehabilitation over the long haul? Any kind of touch-based intervention, to me, it is. If you asked a physical therapist what manual therapy was or is, it's almost um, more associated with um, joint manipulation, spinal manipulation, aggressive chiropractic type maneuvers, you might say, the physical therapists are licensed to do. Um, to other people, manual therapy is... Um, manual circumlaryngeal treatment, which is laryngeal manipulation or laryngeal reposture. Um, to other people, massage is manual therapy. I learned manual therapy back in the early 90s as a modality called myofascial release, which may mean something to some people and no longer means what it used to mean to me because it was all about the rabbit hole of it's your fascia that's stuck and you need to get in there and manipulate your fascia which is very different from somebody doing manual circumlaryngeal treatment that's said to be affecting the muscle tension as an isolated entity, whereas massage might be more working on the muscle knot or the muscle trigger point. And each brand or school of manual therapy seems to have its own tissue-based target or pathology-based target. And the perception that somehow we're able to reach into that person under their skin and just literally primarily and singularly affect that dysfunction. Um, that's where I take issue with a lot of the, the giants from the past and the present to say, you know, manual therapy is a touch-based intervention with a lot of different stories as to why it works. Um, Just to clarify, because I mean, you, you kind of were a little bit, you know, skeptical about my using the term um, expert for you, but um, as clinicians, I don't think we always realize that we speak a different language. <laughs> For um, our listeners who might be less familiar, uh, when there is a lot of tension in the in the laryngeal area, your um, larynx will sit high, high up in the neck. And so when we're talking about reposturing, we're talking about helping it to become lower and there's less tension. Yeah, yeah. And, and even that, I would say, and, I, you know, I probably stick my toe into places I shouldn't stick them, but even that... <laughs> Even that is, is to me a controversial topic because number one, does the larynx stay lower? Um, mm -hmm. And is it because we manually manipulated it or we offered our client, our patient alternatives, ways of self-control, ways of self-awareness and self-change? Um, does the larynx always stay in that idealized posture? I've yet to see a real good study that says that it does that, but yet mm -hmm. from that sort of metaphoric or simplistic sense, we say the larynx is too high. We need to get your larynx down, which we, so we go ahead and we yank the larynx down and the person speaks better, which is some sort of a validation that see, I was right, um, that your larynx was too high. And then, you know, I, what I really love about laryngeal uh, manipulation, Nelson Roy's work, et cetera, is the tapering process, the process that they use to, okay, we're putting it where we think it should be, but now can you take control? Can you find a way within yourself to keep these gains? And to me, it doesn't matter whether the larynx stays low, whether tension truly stays at that lower level that we think we're palpating. What we're looking for is functional changes that the person becomes empowered to be able to um, a certain control on their own. All right. So the expert to me, clinician as expert is the opposite of how I view our work is working or our work should be working, not just manual therapy, but all the work that somehow we've been empowered to be the expert knowing all, which I think really pulls power away from our patients. Instead of seeing, you know, we're going into shared decision making, instead of seeing 
clinician as partner, you know, um, clinician as expert is the way medicine works. And people accept that and they even expect that. And often they don't even allow their voice to be heard in a clinical setting because I know nothing, you're the expert. And all I try and do with this manual therapy model is, is try and balance this out into more of an equal, equal relationship. When, you, when you're talking about um, the, these manual therapies, one, I just have a question. Are you talking about like it's the clinician who then does it to the patient mm. with the idea that then the patient then takes that and does it for themselves? I'm just trying to clarify a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So let me back up just a second, if you don't mind. And then you can then lead me back to where your original question was. Traditionally, manual therapy for voice, which was introduced in 1990 by Aronson, was the clinician as expert, the clinician evaluating, finding high tension, malpositioning of the larynx, et cetera. And then the, the clinician basically making the adjustments in muscle tension, laryngeal positioning, hyoid arrangement, all those things. With, with, and it's a model that is set up as clinician as expert, right? I know what's wrong with you. I know what to do about it and see the literature supports that model. Mm -hmm. And I would never say that that model isn't helpful and doesn't work. The research really supports that really well. But I, I, okay, so I've had my larynx manipulated and it feels like someone's gonna tear my throat out. I am a baby when somebody, I'm in someone's chair on the table, meaning I don't like not having a say in what goes on and not having input into how you grab me, how aggressively you move me, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess some of my own um, wimpiness sort of sort of folded forward into the creation of some of the mo this model that I use that I, we shouldn't be treating ourselves ever, meaning we should never assume that the person we're working with is us and has the same you know predilections and fears and, and expectations, right? But I also think that there's a lot of people like me out there that don't like being worked with aggressively. And which is why I've allowed this model to sort of be one that's more balanced, that I don't know, I know a lot. I am an expert, I'm a content expert, but I'm not an expert in you and your past and your present, your priors and your, and your, your future and your hopes and your expectations until somehow we find a way to pull you into this interaction so you can share with me what you find useful. I appreciate you um, talking about how um, vulnerable or even maybe threatened you might feel when someone is going for your neck and bringing it down. Because, yeah. you know, even our language, we talk about that as going for the jugular as being a very aggressive thing. You know, that's that's the English language. And in the animal kingdom, when animals are going for each other's necks, they're going in for a kill. Well, so and to me, when, when, when you quoted Baker's um, paper, you know, the findings from there, I, I found it interesting because you know, to me, all she is stating is what should be done. And basically to ask permission to explain yes. what you'd like to do, why you'd like to do it and get permission to do it. And I, unfortunately, well, I don't think I've met many manual therapists who say, oh, no, I always make sure you're OK with what we're going to do. But at what level of understanding does the patient, under, you know, are they given? Are they really given options, alternatives? Or are they basically you're a one size fits all clinician? So this is what we're going to do. And to me, Nelson Rice paper is just so brilliant because, you know, what that shows is within the course of a single session, now, to give you the, the, the paper, they, they put this case study woman into an MRI and they had her read a script and they watched what parts of her brain were active and dysregulated, et cetera. And then they pulled her out. They gave her the equivalent of a session of manual circumlayer and trio treatment, reposturing, and then the tapering kind of work. And then they slid her back in the machine and they saw a totally different brain when she reread that script. And I, I, you know, to me, that doesn't prove the problem's not here, it's up here, but it proves that it's a human being we're working with and not just a tissue in distress. The, the thing that I really like about the Roy 2019, the Roy and colleagues 2019 paper is that um, I'm no expert on um, the theoretical basis of that paper, which is um, trait theory. But within trait theory, there's an area um, or an, a region of the brain that they call the behavioral inhibition system. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying that this system is what's working to prevent freedom or agency in the voice. And, and they put her in the MRI 
and they show what region it is. And it's associated with a lot of the emotion processing areas yeah. of the brain that can become affected when there is trauma. Um, and uh, they did this therapy with her and the behavior inhibition system kind of deactivates and the areas related to agency light up. So all of a sudden she has agency and freedom because of this therapy, which, you know, one of the three um, principles in our uh, podcast is to advocate trauma-informed care and um, agency, vocal agency. And so that's why uh, this topic that you wanna bring to our awareness and the awareness of our listeners is so exciting is that we can use manual therapy in a trauma-informed way through shared decision-making to uh, improve vocal agency with people. That's really exciting. Um, and the more I learn about, the more I learn about this work, the more I learn about the multifactorial aspect of touch, of which manual therapy is a style of touch. You know, you can, you can just go down some such, so exciting rabbit holes of, for instance, interoception, certain kinds of touch fuels just caters, fosters interoception for our own internal self-regulation. If the, if the touch is applied in a safe and contextually appropriate way, and you know, it's, I'm biased, I'm definitely biased away from aggressive manipulation, but I would argue that manipulation, except for a small segment of people who really find that work pleasing, really puts somebody in a threat mode. And I don't mm -hmm. think we're able to foster interoception and foster you know, self-control, self-regulation, and so many other things that the research is really talking about that touch has the capabilities of tapping into. Yeah, and, and when we talk about a trauma-informed approach, we really have to acknowledge that a lot of our institutions, including healthcare institutions, medical institutions, can be re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that happens is because, um, some of the uh, decision-making is taken away from individuals. Yeah. And we so- we can add conservatory and performance training to that. We work with a right. lot of people who are dealing with trauma after they graduate um, yes. because of that exact thing. Um, right. there's, there's a toxicity that can happen with the taking away of decision, which in a way is taking away personal dignity and value. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I think that was the, um, you know, the reason why uh, Janet Baker and colleagues in that 2021 consensus paper were saying, you know, just ask permission, say what you yeah. want to do and why, and yeah. ask permission. And it seems like such a no brainer, but here we are in 2021 and we have to tell healthcare workers, yeah, this is something yeah. that 2022, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a year behind. <laughs> You're catching up, it's okay. <laughs> The same thing in pedagogy too is is that idea of like, especially as our practitioners learn higher performance techniques, it's like they can do a lot. You can change the coordination of another human being, and even without touching, like just using using the exercises and tools that we have. And we have to remind them um, that's not a floating head with a voice. That's like, like there's a person around that voice, yeah. you know, yeah. and really yeah. taking that into account. I think a lot of people really have difficulty reimagining their existing work on how, you know, for, for the sake of this discussion of how shared decision making can be implemented and not just manual therapy, although I think actually manual therapists or, or people who've done manual therapy have a more difficult time because it is the clinician as expert model. It's a tiered learning approach. It's one where the more I learn, the more I know of what's wrong with you and what should be done. And and but then, you know, in my seminars, I get I get a lot of clinicians. It tends to be speech pathologists who have zero manual therapy experience. So they're coming in from a framework with, I don't know how to touch. So, okay, let's learn how to touch, but let's also learn how to communicate. Um, and mm -hmm. not that I'm an expert in communication, but I think I've become adept at, at learning how to communicate with my patient in a way that translates that they have power and, and they actually have valuable information to share with me in a, in, a, in a community, a healthcare community or performance community where basically they've been told, you don't know, you need to go to an expert to find out. And those yeah. are tough challenges, not just for the clinician learning the work, but as a patient walks into my room, it's like they just, they expect me to, you know, use that fix it model or they'll say, I don't know. I don't know what I should do. I don't know what I should be feeling. I don't know if this feels safe. And to me, that's, 
it's both the hard work and the and the really gratifying work is to is to empower them. So before we get deeper into that conversation, I just want to ask you one more thing about manual therapy, because um, it seems that although it can be very effective. Uh, manual therapies would need to be repeated unless the patient or student learns how to effectively manage tension mm -hmm. or overactivation of the paralyngeal muscles on their own. So when do you think manual therapies are best used? Um, well, you're talking about a hammer that everything looks like a nail to me. Okay. It is my, <laughs> it's honestly, I'm being honest, it's my primary, primary intervention. I don't believe in a one shot fits all, one size fits all approach because I believe in movement, et cetera. But, um, but yet, um, in, in the show notes here, we're listing a couple studies. One is Lepinin and one is Dehuan. I'm not pronouncing this right, Dehuan. That really showed lasting results. Um, Lepinin with asymptomatic teachers resisting essentially the degradation of a voice over a teaching school year by early application of manual therapy during that and, and teaching self-massage. In their case, they call it voice massage. The Daquan study is manual circumlaryngeal, and it was a minimal style of intervention lasting to the end of the test period, which was six months. So the gains were lasting. Why is it that the gains last? Um, you know, people say, well, you effectively reduce the tension. Well, how does that work? Is it because I was so good and I found the, the doorbell to your tension? Or did we teach strategies of self-efficacy, self-awareness, self-control that you can then do that on your own and continue that, or maybe with self-applied techniques. The one thing that manual therapy in the physical therapy profession has gotten a really bad rap in the last two decades because it's considered passive and it's considered dependency building, um, whereas exercise is viewed as independency building. Now that's sort of a dualism that is just, you know, you tend to pick your side and you'll never see the other side. But to me, if I'm doing passive work on you, Geneva, and you're laying there, not involved at all. And I'm basically acting like the expert and say, okay, you're fixed now without giving you strategies of self-empowerment and, and to continue those gains. I'm really, I think I'm, I'm treating really unethically that this should be about you learning ways not to need me. Um, and to, you know, I, that in the show notes that or the, the, the notes that we shared beforehand, I don't see this work at all as being um, a, a necessarily repeatable type of intervention. If it is, we need to look at other factors. What are we doing wrong? What are we not doing right? What are we missing in this process? Um, to me, you know, just kind of thinking out loud, I would think that a manual therapy would be great for a patient who maybe has a, a severe um, dysphonia and thinks that they cannot produce a voice. Um, and But you can get them to say that they can have freedom right away. So this can change a thought pattern that a person has and change what they believe. I think that is powerful, yeah. you know, because if, you, if you've if you been producing a disordered voice or even been aphonic and think, oh my goodness, my voice is gone and you suddenly have success, that, that can change your mindset, which is powerful. Yeah. My favorite homework to teach a new patient, if they get up off, off my table, out of my chair, however we're working and they feel a change, my favorite homework is to ask them if they have the ability to envision themselves staying like this and not reverting back, or actually do they have the, the potential and the capabilities to be better, to not have this problem. And people look at me like, I'm like, really, you want me to think positive thoughts, but it's not just about that, but how is your internal mental image of who you are? Can you see yourself as not being, you know, throttled by this problem forever? And, I tell you, that's a lot harder than here. Do the sheet of exercises twice a day. It's a lot yes. harder to imagine ourselves as not dysfunctional. Yeah, and I think people don't always know the power of your thoughts. Yeah. I think we're used to because they're with us all the time. You know yeah. that yes, your thoughts can literally limit you, yeah. and so yes, being able to have a new belief can change your whole life. It also you know? is the fuel that gives you the motivation to do the exercises and in the way that you're going to do them. Um, so I, I really think that this mindset component is part of the fuel to, cause it's, it's one thing to, you know, like you have a car, great. I have a way to get someplace, but it, it's just going to sit there unless I put gas in it. And so yeah. I, I think that you touching on this component is really powerful yeah. um, and really should, I'm glad that I'm glad that this is getting highlighted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I think that's one instance where I, I think manual therapy is, is really, really powerful and useful. But, this, you know, the thing to remember, too, is there's no one intervention that works for everybody. It's But, you know, a lot of people dis, dismiss the tool belt analogy. Well, it, the tools don't matter if you if you have a, a really good understanding of the underlying framework, you don't need tools, which I think is a little short sighted. We all have and use tools, whether you call it a different concept. And, you know, one person responds brilliantly to behavioral changes, to behavioral interventions, another through exercise or repetition or coaching. Other people respond really well to touch. And I just, I can, when I teach this work, I teach it to be not a standalone, that it's simply another way to potentially reach somebody. And whether you're using these as single isolated interventions or sort of combined, to me, touch is so much more than what we think we're doing to a tissue. It's, it's touching somebody, letting them know, you know, in the, in the, in the instance of somebody with a surgery, with trauma, with fibrosis, right? Touching somebody, the sense of it's okay to touch and be touched. I mean, talk about psychosocial implications to that person's condition. And I, that's where I, I think that we've, we've gone into manual therapy and manual circumlaryngeal work as if we're, we're, we're reaching in and we're treating a tissue. We're treating tension as if it exists as this thing right here in their throat and not this body-wide, person-wide, human being-wide psychosocial implication of a, maybe a biologically manifested problem. Right. Or even an environmentally manifested uh, problem or politically, depending on the structures and the systems oh, that are gosh. creating the t tension in the person's life. Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. right. You know, we look yeah. at it's another thing. We Touch is not so simple. Thoughts are not so simple. Um, yeah. Attention to me is not so simple either. Um, tension in the manuscript circumlaryngeal literature, especially the older stuff, it's about it's the muscle is tense where, you know, there's objective, supposed objective rating scales. So I can go in and say, oh, you're a three out of four when it comes to tension without any taking into account the normal bell curve of tension. Some people are tight, some people are gushy. What does that mean? And what creates tension, whether it's here or anywhere in the body, um, it's so complex. And that's why I like to think of tension as, as more of a universal aspect versus it's right here. There's your tension right here in your perilaryngeal muscle, right? You know, it is a more complex uh, discussion item than I thought going into this for sure. <laughs> so I yeah, appreciate yeah. The, the things that you said and how you've opened this up. Now is the exciting time that we want to move into our experience, strength, and hope segment so we can talk a little bit more deeply about that shared decision making. So would you, um, I'm going to invite you to kind of share your thoughts on historic implementation, implementation of manual therapy and voice care and implementation with shared decision making. Okay. So um, with a lot of the research that I've been doing for the book and some papers that I've been writing, et cetera, you know, kind of been working on that timeline of manual, manual therapy as applied to voice care. Um, and um, I'm going to go, this is on topic, but it's going to sound off topic for a minute. If you, if you, you can trace it back to Aronson in 1990. In clinical okay. voice disorders, he introduced the concept of using laryngeal manipulation and reposturing for muscle tension dysphonia. And at least from the, from the written literature, that seems to be one of the earliest references. In that paper, Aronson mentions that if you're not aggressive, the, the changes won't last. No footnote, no reference, apparently personal experience. Um, which is fine. We're, when we write, we're allowed to do that, right? Um, but what's happened is ever since 1990, if you go forward in the papers, is basically people are reiterating Aronson as proof that you have to be aggressive. And it's become the norm in voice care manual therapy that it's laryngeal manipulation, because if you're not, it's not going to last. And I've yet to see a study that actually shows that less aggressive means don't work, even though numerous authors in published papers have referenced back to Aronson saying, you gotta be aggressive. Um, so looking through that and then looking at my own history, which was a, a much less aggressive form of work that I started in the early nineties, you know, the, the, the voice field, voice and swallowing field and the PT manual therapy field seeming like they're in separate silos and they never spoke. And there's very little overlap, even though some of the research in the voice field is done by osteopaths and physical therapists, et cetera. It doesn't seem to be any big conversation around more gentler approaches. 
One of my favorite, well, one of my mentors is a physiotherapist from Canada named Diane Jacobs. And she and Jason Silvernail wrote a paper in 2011 called essentially um, comparing the operator model with the interactor model. Operator model is the clinician is expert. It's what physical therapy has been about. And when you then translate that to a broader context, it's what most medical and, and pedagogic type interventions have been about, that I'm the expert. And what they're putting forth in this 2011 paper is an earlier version of shared decision making when it comes to manual therapy, that instead of one person being the operator, how about if they're both interactors, right? interacting with each other? And although they don't use the wording of shared decision making, that was one of my early, um, even before I got into the voice field, seeing that um, really being transmit transformed from how PT was to how it should be. And then I've just, explored this concept of shared decision making in self-reflection on how I like to be treated as a human being as well as a patient and seeing if I could somehow not put on a different hat when I'm a therapist and allow that to be translated into my work both how I treat as well as how I teach. Um, so to me shared decision making there's so much embodied in that approach of respect of not having a patient in fear of being re-traumatized because they're in control. Care decision-making to me is a fluctuating, constantly fluctuating um, dynamic, just like any relationship, personal, romantic, whatever that is. While it's nice that power is equal, it's constantly fluxing and we just, we, we accept that. That's the way it is, right? And that's how it is in, in manual therapeutic interactions as well as other therapeutic interactions. It should be fluxing, but the, it should balance out where the patient truly has a role. And I think if we go into evidence-based model, that's one third of that evidence-based model to me is patient values and expectations. And I've yet to find many manual therapists who are truly elevating that third circle to equal weighting with the research and clinicians experience applying that. I'm telling you, we've said it, you know, we've, we've had maybe what, uh, very few episodes of our podcast. I think you're our sixth. We've had a half a dozen episodes. We keep talking about that patient perspectives. So yeah, it's really exactly. hard for people, you know, because, you know, I think it requires um, a surrender, trusting the patient's experience. And as the clinicians, we trust our own uh, expertise, our own abilities. We've been trained to trust the research evidence. So when a, a patient who doesn't have that comes and says, but this is what works for me, we're like, what in the world? This is, yeah. this is quackery. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or you feel like you're simply giving in to them. But right. I think what we're doing is we're figuring out a way to make it work for this person based right. on their beliefs, their values, their likes, their dislikes versus me right. saying to you, Kristen, here's the best exercise for your throat. And you're thinking, I'm never going to do that. I don't like doing that. And something that you might say, well, okay, I'll try it because Walt's an expert and he said to do it. But if I can find things that you find of value and enjoy, the, yeah. the buy-in is so much better. If we, even if we just took it, taking a look at those long-term outcomes, right? But if I can tap into what you really appreciate and with manual therapy, to me, it's about touching somebody in a way that sparks the, the button in their brain that goes, oh, well, whatever you did, just did, you just, you just connected with that feeling. And that's the frustrating part of my approach for a lot of people is I don't have, I don't teach people a target. Oh, you're after this thing right here. What my target is, is a connection to the patient's experience where their light goes on and they say, yeah, that's it. You've just replicated, you've just calmed it. Whatever you're doing feels relevant. And to me, that's, that's the start of shared decision-making in the kind of work that I do and the kind of work that I teach. I'm seeing all of the mirrored experiences in the the performance training arena because I mean I was also that singer who was making some discoveries off on the side. I brought it to the instructor of like, hey, I was figuring this out. And it was like almost a threatening thing where it got squashed. If they didn't give it to me, yeah. it was like that master and student of like, I know you shut up and do what I say. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was making these other discoveries and like 
I learned very quickly, don't bring them to the table, hide them over here. And it slows down the process. And then I was with some, you know, and later on, somebody was like, bring it on. Like if you make yeah. a discovery, put it on the table. So I think yeah. what makes this conversation also super interesting is that we're talking about it on, on a front level of shared decision-making, but what we're really seeing is a shift of paradigm. So yeah. when we think about the ontological and epistemological like paradigms, meaning what, how is knowledge created who gets to say it's knowledge? Who has the power to, to say it's knowledge or not? How are decisions made? We're talking about big shifts because we're saying now, like it's begging the question, like is the patient or, you know, in my world, the student, like are they blank slates to be written on? Which is very typical, that master student or clinician as expert, very typical of where these sciences came from. I mean, if we talk about like positivist and post-positivist thinking where the natural sciences came out, it's like the, the natural world is to be observed and controlled and predicted. And like even in our research, right, for, for a long time, we talked about it as like we couldn't even acknowledge that we were the author. We had to say the author. I can't even acknowledge the fact that I'm a part of this interpretation here as I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And so we had researcher and participant or even less than participant subject. You know, so right. uh, so this whole the whole field that we have of bringing sciences into voice care, we're looking at we're, we're talking about a paradigm that was built on the idea of separation right. of like experts and not. And so what we're seeing now is this shift from this positivist or post positivist kind of paradigm into something that we would call more constructivist or humanist exactly. where we're exactly. talking about the co-creation of knowledge we're talking about being partners in deciding values and preferences and 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 that those values on both sides get to be part of that decision making process and and we're talking about um the idea of um like in both traditional conservatory stuff and and in um, uh, medical clinical voice care, we're talking about collaborative decision making and, and, you know, who is this, who, what are our actual roles? Like our roles are shifting is what we're seeing, which is kind of big. So we're talking about in shared decision making, we're saying me as the expert or um, in the space, I'm actually going to make space because I know that you have information you know, we don't have a shared nervous system, <laughs> you no, know, so no. we're making space for student agency, patient agency. And that's a massive thing. That's not a that, that's not nothing. So um, yeah. and I think what's interesting is in the research, when we look into co-creation, collaborative decision making, shared decision making, we are seeing um, at, like uh, suggestions of increased satisfaction, better outcomes, the, even the quality of the decisions is better. But I'm also seeing the, the literature also suggests that, that it does require some competency in both the, the provider, you know, the, whoever the, the so-called expert in the space is, but also the patient or the student. There's competencies on both sides. And then the system that's holding it also has to have some, some in, integral structures. So um, while I'm curious, um, while we're saying shared decision making is really important, do you see some barriers or challenges or limitations in shared? Like, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and and it's it's so varied. It's varied with every clinician. It's varied with every patient encounter. Not just with every patient, but every patient encounter. Um, in in the clinicians who don't want to give up their power, right, um, or see that the the patient's opinion is is value less or of less value, but. You know, it's it's I I practice it here in my in my office every day and trying to elevate people to feel like they have worth in this relationship. It's it's a barrier, but it's just to me it's part of the challenge of how I want to make my work work. You know, I'm fond of asking incredibly open ended questions, um, like when I touch somebody and I and I feel something. Right, I say air quotes because what I feel is based on what I was trained, not what is actually happening. I can't feel your problem, um, but I can feel something that might connect with something you recognize, right? And say to my patient, what do you feel? And they sometimes really pause and they look at me like, what do you feel? What do I feel or what do I feel? Almost like I'm, I'm asking them a psychoanalytic question instead of do I feel pain, right? And I, and I don't let myself get trapped by that question. I say, well, what do you feel? And often a question like that is a spark 
to get them to begin to open up. I, because sometimes it's, I feel my, my vocal hoarseness, or sometimes I feel the fear I feel when I can't finish a performance, right? And you go into those layers of, of the true experience, not just the superficial piece or the piece that they expect to regurgitate for you because you're a physical therapist, whoever you are, right? And, and to me, that's part of getting past those barriers is how can I get this person past what they don't think they know and maybe what they do know and show them that it can have value in this relationship. And then I use that to, if we're stretching, right? If we're inputting, if we're doing stuff here in the throat, is there anything about what I'm doing right now that feels threatening or harmful? Do you want me to stop? Is there anything about what I'm doing that feels helpful? And if so, take your hands and put them over mine and help me help you even more. Show me what to do. And they might say, well, I don't know what to do. And I use co-creation all the time in my writing and in my, in my classes. And it's like, well, let's create this together yeah. instead of me doing it. Yeah. And I just think those are those sort of open up or at least help to unlock some of the barriers. There's never there's never one size fits all on how to break down those barriers with clinicians because some clinicians will never let go of power because they're, you know what? Power works. The, the power-based model works because that's how most of the literature in physical therapy is and in voice manual therapy. That clinician as expert is a power-based approach and it works. So why should I let go of that? Some people are looking to transition to something different, maybe based on new literature. I don't know what that might be. In, in terms of educational language, we call it like learning evidence, the learning pit, which means obstacles, and then the lever. But basically, the first thing is to make this interact, like create an environment where there can be the interaction of perspectives, the interaction of agendas. And so the four areas to kind of ask these questions can start to lead into new actions that you can't pre prescribe. So the, the question to help, like when it comes to actually, what do we want the student or the patient to know, do, or be able to understand, like, what is it we want for them? And then the other part of that question is allowing them to kind of ask the question, well, what do I want to know, understand, or be able to do, or what do I want to experience? And mm -hmm. by having interaction between those two things, like the expert, what do they want to accomplish? And the, the I almost said singer, what they want to accomplish just by asking those questions. Now, maybe you do it explicitly or implicitly, that that is contextual and personality dependent but leaving room for those two perspectives to be there so in terms of what will be learned or experienced what do i want and what do they want the next thing is in terms of the evidence like how will we know if they learned it experienced it can do it but then also giving room for the the patient or the student to say well how will i demonstrate that i've learned it experienced it or can do it and so, so that's the evidence component. The third is like, okay, well, in the learning process or in the healing process, there are sometimes obstacles. So then in this, the question for the expert is, well, how will we respond when they don't learn it or they don't experience what we want them to experience? What are those obstacles and what are the strategies I'm going to use to elicit a breakthrough, right? That's my question. And then leaving room in the arena for them to say, well, what will I do when I'm not learning? You know, what, what do, like in terms of evidence, um, what, how do I want to present that I have or have not learned it? And then the, the last part, so we did the, like the idea of what will be learned. The next one is how will we know? Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the evidence one for, for the student was how will I demonstrate that I've learned it? There it is. How will I demonstrate I've learned it? And then the obstacles are like, okay, if it's not working, here's what I think the strategies could be. But if it's not working for you, patient or student, what are some things that you want? Like if you're not learning, what, what's gonna work for you as we move forward to overcome this strategy, uh, to overcome this obstacle? And the, the last part is the lever. It's the idea of how, how will we as the experts help them um, like extend their proficiency. So a lot of times we don't want them just to <clears throat> experience the 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 lowest bar of experience, skill, or or you know, um, uh, yeah, um, or understanding. We want like the good to become better. Like we can just keep them going, right? But sometimes they want to get off the train earlier. <laughs> like so, what is it that 
that they're going to do with it. So there's, there's what we want to do to extend from good to better or from troubled to good, depending on, on where our starting point is, but also leaving space for like, what do they actually want to do with it? You mm -hmm. know, what will I do when, when I have the thing that I want? And, and when we leave spaces for what will be learned, the how are we going to know if it got learned or experienced? Um, what are the obstacles? How are we going to deal with those? And then what is the actual goal that we want? And if we leave room for both perspectives to have interaction, then you've got kind of the, the container where shared decision-making can happen. So, so those are some of the things for, for practitioners to play around with um, if, if they wanna start bringing more uh, shared decision-making into their thinking and into their practice. So, um, you know, as I'm talking, well, do you have any other like tips or experience, experiences or anything that you would wanna share to help somebody successfully implement more shared decision-making in their, in their practice? Um, I, I, yeah, some of it, I think you're, you, you've actually covered in different from a different perspective, but to me, one of the most important pieces is allowing their story to be told, mm -hmm. their story to have value um, because in the healthcare setting, the patient story is often devalued as, yes. well, that's silly, that doesn't make any sense. And to me, those are some of the worst things that a patient, a person can feel. And I, that's, you know, in terms of my one-on-one -on -one with a patient here, that, that allowing them to tell their story and to have their story be, be not wrong. You know, going back to Carl Rogers and talking about, you know, it, it, it's their story. We can never discount it as being accurate because it's their lived experience that I, I try to honor that as much as possible. And we've all got our biases. We do. We, we have our beliefs. And when somebody says something that's so contradictory to what the evidence says or our experience says, you want to just sort of correct them. But I, I, that's one thing that I try both to do and teach is allow that story to be what, what sort of builds the fabric of what we're doing here. And, you know, if their story seems to need changing, correcting, that's her down the road, right? Um, but right now your, your story is your life and that's what you're bringing here. Um, I, I think it, it's difficult too for some people who feel that we shouldn't be letting our patient, our student, our client, um, basically dictate what we're doing. And I hear that in PT a lot, all the time. When you talk about shared decision-making, it's like, well, it's not, it's not like we're gonna ask our patient what they should do, because what do they need us for? It's like, you're not giving them this blank slate to say, okay, what should we do today? But you work from the goal and you start from the direction of, okay, I'm gonna input a little bit of what I think is going on as the expert, but then you sort of pass the baton and say, but what we're doing right now, does it feel useful? And I don't care whether it's manual therapy or, or voice coaching or whatever that might be. Do you find this to be useful for you? And those aren't easy answers for people, but once they start feeling comfortable answering them and it's safe to answer them, I think that's when things really build quickly. So to me, those are some of the biggest tips that I can do. Recognizing too, okay, there's more, one more recognizing that fact that I, I love, a, a, it's in the show notes, a paper by McParland in 2022, where they, they sort of balance psychotherapeutic models of a, a, the interventionist connecting the person's present to their priors with the ability of touch to sometimes make those same connections that by touch with the way we're working with this model is that we're trying to get the person to feel a sense of connection to the priors, not necessarily, maybe the big things in life that form them, but the sense of a prior experience that drew them here in the present. And I love that paper because it really in a nutshell says what we're trying to do to bring a sense of awareness and meaning to what we're doing beyond, we need to break up this tension. It's like, no, we need to connect you with something that you find meaningful from the past and current and allow you to create with me um, a, a, a new option for you. I love that and, and create a new option. Like I, um, I've had situations in the studio where um, say if we have a, a belter who's working too hard, needs to learn how to rebalance kind of the flow pressure ratio. And I could potentially give them something from the 24 Italian arts book, you know, um, from the, the 17th century, or I could um, ask them, say, hey, we need some repertoire that has some of 
this kind of line or these kinds of vowels or this kind of tessitor, this kind of range. Um, and in the style that you like, if I have it, I can bring it forward, but I can ask, help them say, hey, this is what we need in the genres that light you up. Can you find something that fits this criteria? Yeah, and yeah. so we're we're meeting the agenda that has to be done for their skill for their development, um, and sometimes their their vocal safety, and but it's all aligned with what they act their story. You know what yeah, they're yeah. actually called to do musically um, as the expression of their voice on the outside of what they're feeling on the inside. Yeah, yeah, love that. Well, this was really, really good. I have to say, um, Walt, that we really enjoyed co-creating this episode with you. <laughs> and we would love to invite you to come back anytime. Just let us know. Oh, just reach that, out. Yeah. In this episode, we talked about how we can use manual therapy as an agentic practice to improve vocal agency in individuals suffering from primary muscle tension dysphonia. We also discussed how shared decision-making can help build trust and create psychologically safe interactions where power is shared between clinicians and patients or educators and students. To our listeners, thank you for your ongoing support and for listening. Take care.